I think all of her hair is falling out. This is a disaster. You got here, all these them fell out. I wouldn't even feed this to my dog. I feel awful about this. You seem kind of busted up. Tonight, our contributor and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Charlie LaDuff, investigates the water scandal in Flint and questions the governor, who says he's responsible. I'm taking responsibility, but I want to fix the problem. Plus, we'll map out the road to New Hampshire, bring you projections and perspective from our pollster, Matt Towering, who nailed it in Iowa. The American story is a miracle. And we'll take you inside the Rubio campaign with his communications director, Alex Conant. This is Money, Power, and Politics. We'll start on the campaign trail, and since the cruise camp said Ben Carson was gone when he had really just gone to Florida, and attacks on all sides are taking lines out of context, we like to show them how it feels when we take them deliberately out of context. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, as you were introducing me, I was thinking about what I was going to say. It's probably not the best way to plan for these things. An unprepared so Jeb Bush greets ideas. students with terrible advice on fire safety up. week. When you see a problem, you run to the fire rather than pull away and cut and run. Fire is <laughs> your fire. Meanwhile, Chris Christie inadvertently reveals why he's still in the race. I really don't like being governor anymore. And I really prefer running for president to being governor. So I know that my state's going to be hit with two feet of snow. But you know what? I'm not going back because it's not going to really matter. Say what? And a bizarro Ben Carson just set the record for the worst campaign speech in history. I would try to divide all the people. And then I would try to destroy the financial foundation of the country by driving the debt to unimaginable levels. And then I would destroy the military. Those are the things that I would do if I were in charge. I would try to destroy America. <laughs> Wait, what? Okay, while most of the pollsters missed the mark in Iowa, we correctly predicted the Republican race, and our first guest helped us do it. Across the nation, pundits predicted Trump would win, followed by Cruz and then Marco Rubio, a distant third based on the polls. But once again, Iowa proved the pollsters wrong, with one exception. The polling that we're doing is showing Cruz adding to his numbers in most places. It's a Donald Trump. Our Fox 13 pollster Matt Towery and his son Matthew Towery nailed it. And that helped me predict the story from Iowa before the voters spoke. And that's where Ted Cruz may have an edge. But I'm telling you, the wild card to watch tonight is going to be Marco Rubio. Don't be surprised if Rubio exceeds expectations tonight. So while Cruz and Rubio scored the big headlines this week, our Fox 13 pollsters with opinion savvy and insider advantage made some headlines as well. They got credit for producing the only major national poll to show that Trump may lose to Cruz and that Rubio would place a very close third. They had Rubio in third, one point behind, and he finished in third, one point behind. We used that data, along with our experiences on the trail in Iowa, to predict record turnout and a Rubio surge. Do you expect any upsets? I think I think we could see a surprise in the Republican turnout tonight. Look for Marco Rubio to make a move. Okay, and with that, please welcome Fox 13 and Fox 35 pollster Matt Towery. Thank you so much for your work here. Tell us first <laughs> what insider advantage and opinion savvy knew or did that the other big pollsters did not. Well, you know, it's interesting. For years, I had an insider advantage, and we polled. But about a, a few years ago, I decided that I was getting towards my retirement time period, and my son opened his own firm called Opinion Savvy. And we sort of worked together, but he does the work, and he was the one who got it right. What he did is he went into Iowa late. He stayed in the field later than the other pollsters. And he also has an excellent mix of both phone interviews and also handheld devices. He doesn't just rely on cell phones because people don't answer cell phones, and they won't talk to you very long. So he gets to those handheld devices which people will answer when they look at them and he got the youth vote he got the ev evangelical vote he he balanced it out right and he came obviously the closest of all the pollsters in the country of which as a as a father i'm very proud of him and since you and he are now playing the hot hand tell us what you're seeing and what you expect in new hampshire beginning with the republicans 
Sure. Well, on the Republican side, I think Donald Trump will still be able to pull off a win there because the time frame is just simply uh, too difficult for these other candidates to overcome. So Ted Cruz is going to have a hard problem uh, trying to be number two and sustain his uh, numbers because New Hampshire just is not an evangelical state versus I oh, uh, Iowa, where there's a, certainly a, a large evangelical vote that went his way. And what is the data telling you in the Democratic race? Where is that story going in New Hampshire and beyond? Well, in New Hampshire, of course, it's going to be Bernie Sanders. And, and what that also creates is an interesting dynamic because Hillary Clinton won Iowa, but she won it by, what, six flips of the coin, some might say. So as a result, it's very close. And so she comes into South Carolina with a lead in the polls. But the question there is, what, how does she hold on to that lead? Well, partially because she usually does well with African-American voters, and the South Carolina primary is basically dominated by African-American voters. They, they are the predominant group that vote in that primary. I will say this, though, and I posited this in my national column this last week. I wonder if Bernie Sanders might reach out and try to find an African-American putative vice presidential running mate. In other words, someone who doesn't get the nomination yet, but who he says, I'm going to nominate this person if you give me the nomination for president. If he were due to do that um, and it were an African-American candidate, uh, maybe a strong name, that could potentially make Bernie Sanders a big player in these southern races as well. We'll wait and see. Matt, thank you so much for your time and for your insight. Great stuff. Thank you, Craig. Coming up. We poisoned the kids in, in Flint, didn't we? I want the truth. This is not a third world country. Americans were poisoned to save a buck. We'll show you how our government failed us in Flint and Michigan's governor sits down with Charlie LaDuff. The poison water in Flint, Michigan is a scandal and a national disgrace. We have a health crisis and a cleanup bill that could cost more than a billion dollars. So we asked Charlie LaDuff to join us. But first, here's what he found. Flint, Michigan, the birthplace of General Motors and the UAW and Mass Credit. There was plenty of money and plenty of work and the Flint River grew so toxic it was said you could clean brass with it. Flint was rich. It didn't need the river. It could afford to ship its water from Detroit, 70 miles away. But then Flint's jobs went to Mexico, and Flint went broke. And then two years ago, in order to save some money, the governor and his men ordered the people who were left to drink from the river. You are trying to kill my kids. Really? Don't get me wrong. I'm a very loving person, but you're doing things to hurt my children. Today, the children of Flint have elevated levels of lead in their blood. 10 adults have died from a waterborne virus. The main suspect there, the Flint River. And this whole time, the government, which is supposed to look out for the citizens, told no one. How could this be in America? The governor says, how much will this cost? And the, and the advisor said, it will cost $100 a day for three months. $100 a day for three months. And the governor said, that's too much money. Let them drink the Flint River water. We're going to build the Michigan back that we had before, but even better. A few years ago, Republican Governor Rick Snyder stripped Flint's elected officials of their power and placed it in the hands of an emergency financial manager. The manager ordered Flint to leave Detroit's water and join a new, cheaper water system. But that new system wouldn't be ready for two years. So in the meantime, to save a few million bucks, the people of Flint would drink from the toilet. I wouldn't even feed this to my dog. It's freaking ridiculous. State Treasurer Andy Dillon made the final call then, but now on the hot seat, the governor's men tried to weasel around that fact. Governor Rick Snyder releasing his emails regarding the Flint water crisis. By still coming through those emails, most of it... Flint's elected leaders, with no real power, rubber-stamped the water idea. Now, the, the Flint community was betrayed. Uh, we had every reason to expect that the water we were drinking was being treated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Communities all across this country have water sources 
from all over the place. It all has to be treated the same. That's what we were told. Uh, that's what I shared with the public when I was asked because that's what I was uh, understanding at the time. So I was out there, city council members, other city staff, and then um, we get the admission from the governor that the state didn't follow the Safe Drinking Water Act. The corrosion controls weren't in place. I cut down their bath, you know, times I give them a bath a week, very minimal because of the rashes and the, the, the spots that pop up on them. And I think all of our hair is falling out. Now Flint's aging pipes are corroded and lead from them is leaching into the tap water. Really? Governor Snyder has taken responsibility to a point. Flint's poor, it's majority black, they feel like you've abandoned them. Is this your Katrina? Well, if you look at it, this is a disaster. I mean, this is something that I had people that worked for me, to be blunt, that let all of us down. But I'm responsible, so I'm not trying to get out of that. You have to be responsible for these things. I'm taking responsibility, but I want to fix the problem. Lead poisoning aside, how could the governor not have known the water was unfit for a pig? From the beginning, the warning signs were there. The river water was contaminated with fecal matter. Citizens were told to boil it. Authorities poured in so much chlorine to kill the bacteria, they created a toxic bomb harmful to infants and elderly. General Motors said the water was corroding its parts. Flint citizens, however, were given no choice but to continue bathing in it. This just started coming out about a year or so ago. My teeth had started falling out a year. You know, these right here, I'm going to Dennis and David. See, these right here, all these of them fell out. It's now been unearthed that the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and the State Department of Environmental Quality knew there were potentially dangerous levels of lead in Flint's water. First they were silent, and then they denied it. How Let me start here. Uh, anyone who is concerned about lead in the drinking water in Flint can, can relax. Uh, there, there is no broad problem right now that we've seen with lead in the drinking water in Flint. Residents were blown off for 19 months until independent tests by a scientist and a doctor confirmed the dangerous levels of lead. And only then, in October, nearly two years later, did the governor acknowledge that Flint had a water crisis. The price to fix it could run into the billions. The health effects in children, unknown. Okay, Charlie, I want to start with a question you asked the governor. Would you have your grandchildren bathe daily in that water coming out of those pipes now? Yeah. You would? Yeah, because again, that's the advice I've gotten. Does it ever occur to this governor that he might be getting bad advice up front? Yeah, well, first of all, the governor doesn't have grandchildren, so it's an easy question to answer, right? But um, look at his point of view. Think about it. How else would you know if it's safe? He, you ask a hydrologist. The experts were the ones that were supposed to keep the water safe. So that's an ironic answer to the question. The scientists became bureaucrats. The bureaucrats uh, were enabled with contractors. Everybody wants a deal done. We're going to push bad water through. And you ultimately have to rely on the science. But when the science is compromised, well, how the hell is the governor supposed to answer it? Well, however he answers it, he's a fool. He can't give you a date. Be bold. When will this be fixed? Give me a date. Give well, me a I, year. Yeah, I wish it was that simple. He cannot give you a goal, a stated time in which this can be fixed. Why is that? One, it's maybe proper not to give a date because you make false promises. You're playing to the media. But I do fault him for not stating a goal. The goal as quick as possible. The end of the month if I could make it so. Three months if I could make it so. But remember, we're asking you in Florida and people in California, New York, to take your money and send it to us. We need a billion. But where's the science? Where's the credible leadership 
in Congress. Everybody wants to whip each other. Everybody wants to make talking points. It's an election year. Let's calm down, do right by each other. Remember, there's not a huge pot of public money. Let's do it methodically. I'll give them credit for that. But that's not good enough for people with children in Flint. So you're between a rock and a hard place. Charlie, we're going to stay on this and come back to you for now. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Coming up, we'll head back to New Hampshire and show you what to expect from Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. Beyond the winter weather, Iowa and New Hampshire have little in common, especially in politics. In Iowa, two-thirds of the GOP caucus goers were evangelical Christians and nearly all said they're conservative. New Hampshire is a moderate state where many voters are not as religious and they carry just as much clout, if not more influence, in choosing our president. Y'all treat politics in New Hampshire like we treat football in Texas. <laughs> Mike Boucher runs a car repair shop in Manchester, and here's all the scuttlebutt. I look at it as similar to a barbershop. You know, people come in, they voice their opinion. And they tend to be focused on national security and jobs. Jobs are a huge thing. Um, you know, I still see people that come in here that are suffering. They're lose they've lost their jobs or they're losing their jobs and they can't find jobs and they're discouraged. Boucher said he's leaning Trump or Rubio, but like many in New Hampshire, could change his mind. You know, for, I'm a typical New Hampshire person. I, I don't know who I'm voting for yet, and I usually wait till like a couple days before to make my decision. And as the late deciders think it over, Evan Axelbank shows us what's at stake for Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. The forecast for primary day is enough to keep a Floridian inside if you're not running for president. For Jeb Bush, the stakes are these. He simply can't come in sixth place again, not with such a big campaign account, not with his name recognition, and not in short, with such high expectations. Jeb has hope, says Trent Spiner, the executive editor of New Hampshire's biggest newspaper. GOP voters in that state are more moderate than Iowa's. Independents are also allowed to vote. And Bush has a big ground game. Both of them are in better, better positions here in New Hampshire than they were in Iowa. They have uh, incredible local staff here, great strategists, and they have a serious ground game. Marco Rubio has a bit more leeway. He beat Jeb by 20 points in Iowa, came in third overall there, and is using his personal touch in New Hampshire. Here's the thing about Marco Rubio that Jeb Bush doesn't have. Marco Rubio can get up in front of an audience in New Hampshire and people are in tears. With Cruz focusing more on South Carolina, Rubio's goal is at least second. If Marco Rubio comes in second place in New Hampshire, he's going to be a superstar. And Spiner suggests Rubio could even win. Though Donald Trump's poll numbers are considerably higher now, Spiner doesn't necessarily buy it. It's very possible that these are completely wrong. 11 polls in Iowa were wrong about Donald Trump. 11 polls. We've had 77 in New Hampshire. The forecast for New Hampshire is in the high 30s. Both Bush and Rubio would love to beat that with the only poll that matters. Evan Axelbank reporting for Money, Power and Politics. We're joined now by Alex Conant, who is Communications Director for Marco Rubio. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Walk us through the strategy for New Hampshire. What has Marco Rubio been doing? How many volunteers are there? How will you wind up? We're running TV ads in New Hampshire. We've spent a lot of time on the ground in New Hampshire. We've got two offices, a whole lot of staff, and even more volunteers. So we think we can do very well in New Hampshire. What are the driving issues in New Hampshire? What will drive voting behavior there? You know, I think taxes and national security are two huge issues in in New Hampshire. People in New Hampshire, they really care about the national debt. They care about growing the economy. They know we need to keep taxes down. I think that's why we're, we have a good chance in New Hampshire because they like Marco's pro-family tax plan. And then on national security, nobody understands the threats facing America in the 21st century better than Marco Rubio. Walk us through the strategy beyond South Carolina heading into March 15th. Where will you be, you think, in the scheme of things? And how much money will it take to get from here to there? It's, it's going to be a long process. It's going to be a grind. All the delegates are awarded proportionally before we get to Ohio and Florida on March 15th. And so that means it's unlikely you'll see any one candidate get too far ahead of the, of the others. And then, of course, we get to the, uh, the all-important Florida primary, which Marco's going to win that, that primary. We're, we're going to do everything we can to, to make sure that Florida remains Marco country. Coming up, Jeb Bush had a tough crowd this week. Please clap. 
so we'll show you what he could do to rev them up. I just want, I want my damn selfie and I'm not leaving until I get it, so. All right, this week Jeb Bush delivered his applause line then asked his lackluster crowd to please clap. So we wondered what it would take to get his crowds excited. We thought maybe some stand-up comedy or the right to rise with stand-up Jeb. The selfie is now the 11th Amendment of the Bill of Rights. <laughs> it is a requirement that you take one, and I do it with great joy in my heart. I don't know, look, I just want, I want my damn selfie and I'm not leaving until I get it, so. <laughs> it's cooler to do it diagonally rather than straight up. <laughs> and it's better to do it higher than lower because you look skinnier. <laughs> Am I right? And on that note, good night, everybody. I'd like to thank our political team. We also have full coverage of the New Hampshire primary as the results come in on Tuesday night. And, of course, we will be right back here next week. We'll see you then.